Yes. We are from iParadise.com or Trinidad, and they push you to say yes. My apologies, is that better? Okay. Um, iParadigms does anti-plagiarism software, or we call it originality reporting. So students submit papers to us. We check them against data for originality, um, not only against other students' papers, but against a wide variety of things that we've crawled, publications, et cetera, et cetera. And this has been years now. Samantha Billington. Um, Twitter, Ms. Samantha. And I'm Fred Moyer. Uh, Fred Moyer on Twitter. Can you guys hear me okay on this? Great. So we're going to take you through the, um, the seven stages of scaling or grief, as we've called them. So typically, those are shock, denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining, depression, reflection, the upward turn, uh, reconstruction, and then finally acceptance hope. We have found that we go through very, very similar things when you scale an application. We can totally throw hardware at this. That's great, we'll just keep buying hardware, that's awesome, monolithic scaling. And then you get into the, but that's expensive, and that's hard to back up. And there's problems with that. Well, now we're at a point where we just can't monolithic scale because there's no hardware for that. Um, but if we do it this way, no, no, we want to do it that way. No, we can't do it that way because we have an application that is 15 years old and we have to stick with this because that's how we get out to the people later and the back and forth. Um, you get into the, well, we do it that way. We um, then you hit the upward turn. There's only 150 bugs left. That's awesome. There were X hundred before. And finally, you get to release them. We are fond of that. And beer and therapy or beer beer. So the problem is the big problem that everybody faces when they're scaling. Sure. Thank you. Um, so the problems that everybody faces when you're trying to scale a large database are the ability to back up. Um, we, using Postgres, PG dump, that requires you know, X amount of gigs that then have to be moved off the server onto another, um, another platform, and then you're dealing with the restore. Okay, something goes wrong. Well, we have to wait hours for the database to restore, or we can do a targeted restore, but either way, it's a, it's a very serious um, thing to go through. Um, we have resource contention. So we were getting query plans that were suboptimal because we had very large sets of data and weren't distributed um, in a very logical way. All the problems that you normally would come across with a large database of that size that has been growing. Um, we actually have two shards. We have a geographically dispersed. So we have a main shard and the shard just for the UK. Um, so we had the problem where these were not equal. We could not distribute them in a way that took um, adequate use of the hardware. And we also had non-overlapping ID spaces, or we had overlapping ID spaces. So account ID one in the US was not the same as account ID one in the UK, which made lots of things like global statistics reporting and whatnot um, a very serious problem. Um, so we looked at solutions to this problem. There's account-based sharding. So in our case, that's usually an institution. Um, so we could break them all across this. We could do that. Um, that's an option, but it wasn't necessarily the best option for us because how do you handle a student when they move colleges? Students do that all the time. They go from JCs to four-year colleges. They move wasn't necessarily the easiest thing for us to tackle. Um, geographical based sharding, which we already have in a certain light, all the problems I um, already went through, you can't really um, spread these evenly across servers, no load distribution, whatnot. Oracle Rack for us was prohibitively expensive um, and possibly not exactly what we needed in terms of use scenario. 
Um, and then there was horizontal sharding. So we could take the tables that were the largest and that we queried the most and move those into a separate physical host. Um, it required breaking relational constraints, so cascade replication, data integrity, um, but it was a very good path to a service-oriented architecture, which means that we could look at this thing that had been built as a whole and determine what services, what individual pieces could be broken out and put into separate places. So why did we discuss that before phase one, where phase one was a diagnosis? Um, because this is a very old company in terms of technology. It's been around for a long time. And people wanted to choose a solution based on the things that they felt they had seen over the years. Those were tainted views, so to speak, in that they didn't address the, the problem as a whole. They addressed what do we see in front of us. Um, I came in a year and a half ago and was handed this problem with a completely objective point of view. I wasn't familiar with the hardware, I wasn't familiar with the software, had no familiarity with the political levels, but I could look at the problem and say, this is your easiest path based on certain factors, and it was vastly different than the solutions that were being thrown around to begin with. Sometimes you need that. You need to step away, have someone who's not familiar with the problem come in and say, given all these factors, these ones that you ignored perhaps were more important, or maybe that one that you thought wasn't as volatile is more critical. So in the process of triage, you have to ask, what's gonna kill you first? What single point in the scaling problem is more important than all the rest? What is the one thing that, is it RAM? Is it IO? Is it uh, hardware constraints of doing backups? What is the one single thing that you have to tackle first? Because it's very unlikely that you have the resources to rewrite your entire stack ground up and do that in a way that you cannot seriously cripple your service. So this was the first stage diagnosis. These are the top tables in our database. Um, and there's one table there. It is the red line right in the middle. That's the one we targeted. And we targeted that one because the purple line and the, the uh, bottommost line are two wholly contained subsets of one of the other tables. So there's a one-to-one -one relation on IDs there where you have a paper ID and an object ID, where the object ID is a parent, the paper ID is a subset of data about that. So they were very, very closely tied, and then you get their stats about that paper. So your object, the original thing that a student uploaded, has two separate subtables for it. Whereas the one red table there had a higher growth rate. It's actually a newer service. It's our marking service, which meant that when a paper is uploaded, um, instructors can go in and add marks to that. They can grade it. They can say, hey, this thing right here, that doesn't really make sense, or your grammar is wrong. And we hold all of those in that one single table. That showed that those, of course, being a one to many, you have multiple marks per paper, was growing. And it was growing at a much faster rate than any of the other tables, even though this doesn't quite show that. This is a two-month sample at the beginning of a semester. But that service was years younger than the others, and it had been introduced and was almost eclipsing the other two in size. It was currently approaching a billion rows. So our overall database, 507 gigabytes, M object paper being the subset and M report stats being the subject of M object, and the GM3 mark table. So those four things, those four tables alone were half of the bulk of the entire database. Everything else was a leaf table, it was a statistics table, it was something that was very small, easily contained. This is the first thing that everybody asks you when you say my database is too big or my table has a problem, is they say, what about table sharding? Why don't you use inheritance? Why don't you just break that down, have a parent-child? 
That works really well if you've designed your table like that. If you can say that this one row in this table can have a constraint that breaks down that shard into nice little pieces and every query will use that constraint, that's great. That means that you have a hot shard that you can keep in memory, its index is in memory, and the others will grow cold. So you're still dealing with storage issues, but your RAM issues pretty much subside, your query performance increases. Sadly, we didn't have the ability to do that because this is a very tightly relationally coupled database. There were constraints in here where we queried across many different aspects of those primary tables, and it made it just absolutely impossible to do this. The result was a three-month proposition. I'm sorry, it was a two-year proposition that was broken down into three parts. It was a short, mid, and long-term goals, where the first part was to take a look at all those queries that couldn't be broken down by time or by account and try and find some reason that they couldn't do that. Try and refactor them, make them more uh, efficient so that we could eventually take those tables and break them down into, into usable shards. And the second part was that table that was growing faster than the rest, that was a separate service, that was seen really as a leaf node to everything else, just remove it. Remove it, all its dependencies, make it a separate service, and preserve the stability of the original service by removing this piece. Part two, ID reconciliation. So those geographical shards that I talked about where we had the UK and the main database for the rest of the world, we needed to bring those back into one so that they could then be redistributed and pulled out into hardware and evenly loaded, tested, whatnot. So step two, ID reconciliation, and then going back to the query partitioning that we had done before, repartition those tables so that we can more efficiently query on them. And then the long term was no, really, let's make the service and the database separate, create a data access layer, layer or a DAL so that we had some bulkheads. So if something happened at the database layer, we weren't taking that debt all the way up to the application and possibly causing issues or, um, or limiting our scalability by the fact that we are tightly coupled in that way. And then removing those large tables, perhaps maybe Cassandra or Mongo or some other type of storage yet to be determined. And finally, a global statistics reporting, because with the way that we were currently set up, we didn't have the ability to traverse the both of them in an efficient way. So 12 months later, we've finished our three months goal. We did not think short term meant what we think it meant. This is the very basic summary of what we did. The original database, the 500 gig uh, main database, and the subset database marks. So this is just a visual cue for, we took the entire thing, and this little thing down here that was a quarter of that data, just completely separated it out. So we started with the schema. Um, and being a DBA, I'm of the belief that all good applications start with your data, data design and move up from there. So it was very, very tedious. It meant going through the main table that we originally wanted to isolate, going through all of its foreign key constraints, all of its cascading references, and following them through, um, which primarily falls on one team. It's very slow, and this is what that looks like. I'm sure most of you have seen a table, done the slash D on it, and seen this is, these are, this is an example of the primary table that we were taking out. So we had to determine each of these keys is something that we needed to recreate in code. Do we need to go back and, and make sure that when we delete, we cascade that? Do we need to refactor queries because they're going to be looking for that relation directly? So it was a very critical step because the, the, the set of tables that we were taking out of the main database determined what the developers were then going to base all of their logic on. The original database was 236 tables. The new main database ended up being 192, and the new marks database was 40. That doesn't add up, and that's because of tech debt. So. Originally, we wanted to uh, create a data access layer to start off with. Um, that had a number of appealing uh, things about the approach. Um, we could make a whole new code base just talking to this database. Um, and we looked at several different languages. Uh, Golang looked really attractive. Uh, 
I don't know if how many of you guys have, here have used Golang. Um, there's a module web.go, which creates an out-of-the-box uh, REST framework. And I was able to put together uh, a prototype in probably about a week. So it's really easy to work with. Other things attractive about this approach were we could just write off a lot of existing technical debt. We didn't have to deal with it. Um, but then, you know, the more we looked at it, there were some downsides also. You know, we had 14 years of code, um, 14 years of features, various different products. Um, some of those products are very old. They have no specs. Um, so we relied mostly on tribal knowledge and, uh, you know, talking to people who had been at the company a long time to determine, well, what exactly does this do? Where's the code for it? Um, oh, yeah, you know, there's a whole other subversion repository here you also need to know about. So there was a lot of dark matter that uh, we were looking at dealing with. Uh, second option, which... Um, we looked at was actually just going into the existing code base and adding additional database handles to the new database. Uh, it, originally, it looked like this was a safe approach, but the more I dug into the code, looked at different code bases, looked at custom database code connection we had, um, it started to scare me because, you know, what do I do if our database multiplexer doesn't handle um, namespaces to the different databases correctly. You know, am I going to step on my database connections without knowing about it? Um, and another thing that scared me about this approach is all that technical debt you've accumulated, now you've got to pay it. And um, it's, you know, all of you are familiar with technical debt. Um, it's, you know, you can't make it go away. It's always, it's always going to be there to some degree. And spending a lot of time on that was really not one of the things I wanted to do. But, um, you know, there was probably the deciding advantage that um, this approach would preserve all of that tribal knowledge and all of that dark matter to a large degree. And there's also the concept of sacred cows. Sacred cow is a piece of your infrastructure that uh, someone wrote, and people are attached to it emotionally. And that's you know you can argue logically that well you know this piece of code is 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 dated. Um, it has a certain maintenance cost. We need to get rid of it. But um, it's really an emotional um, negotiation you need to make to get people to realize well. You know, parts of this code we we just need to replace in this effort, or it's going to be, you know, too expensive to, you know, try to keep it up to date. So, in scaling some of the, in looking at some of the hardware needs for the second database, we thought, well, you know, it's you know it's a smaller database. We can probably use smaller hardware. Uh, that turned turned out to not be totally true. Um, RAM, you know, we wanted to keep the RAM high, but um, we didn't need as much CPU and storage. Uh, keeping the RAM high was pretty much critical to maintaining the plans that the existing query planner was, was using. And we, Samantha and I had to talk about this. Well, what do we do if this effort fails? Um, you know, we had a pretty solid rollback plan, so we'd roll back the database um, and uh, update our LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> we didn't have to do that. No, we didn't have to do that. Um, so this led to our rollback plan. How do you bifurcate a database and roll back without data loss? Because once you split that, you're reading to two or you're writing to two different databases. Merging those back together is not easy. So we talked about several different things. We talked about replaying logs. Uh, we talked about trying to mesh the data back in by hand. Um, there's several different things we talked about. We ended up on Sloney. And this was an example of leveraging your tech debt because we use Sloney already. Don't judge us. Um, we were able to split the Sony replication set and have a portion of it remain exactly as it was and continue replicating to our production hardware. And the new set, which was just the critical tables, was now going to the new set of hardware that we would be rolling out the new um, service on. 
So in this case, timelines matter. This was something we didn't want to wait until the last minute for, do it in advance. We split replication five weeks in advance, which allowed us to burn in our hardware. We were able to test for performance on it to some degree. We were able to test the process of doing this. Um, so test it, test it again, and then test it again. And when you think you're done, test it again. So this is the step of archaeology. When we actually began this process and we started looking at the schema, that tech debt that I mentioned where the tables didn't actually add up, that was for a variety of reasons. We had legacy tables in there from services that didn't actually exist, so we dropped them. And then we had services that were still around but we didn't support, so we dropped them. We basically said, hey, what's that? Can we drop it? Let's drop it. Because dropping it meant that we didn't have to code for it. It was a great way to clean up tech debt. And then we found that one. We found a situation where a previous version of the software still had tables that were not the exacting, the, weren't the tables that we were using. They were a version two, two uh, versions ago that a customer was still using actively through URL manipulation, going back into the old service inputting their data, and then we had a portion of the code that specifically moved it from those tables to the new tables. This did not make for happy times. So this was a portion where we had to stop the prop, well, we had to plan carefully, go back to the customer and ease them into using a new thing that they didn't want to use to the point where you know, we had made all these exceptions just for them. It was finally time to cut that cord, tell them, no, you really have to do the new thing now. So. It's a great example of how technically you can have the best plan in the world, but you need a little hand holding now and then. So talking more about archaeology, 14 years of application development. Uh, there are still some places in our code that I've seen, you know, revision numbers in the double digits. I saw revision number 16 today. Uh, we had about five major code bases and quite an array of support utilities hundreds of code points um, for database connections. Some of the old legacy ASP code uh, did connection statements in the code itself where some of the newer code had uh, ORM-based connections. The ORM-based connections tended to be uh, more difficult to refactor, but you had to do it in a lot fewer places. Um, the legacy code base itself had accumulated about half a dozen ORMs within the code base and between the other uh, applications, you know, total up about a dozen different ORMs that we had to refactor. And there's also fun stuff of dynamic SQL, which is generated by those ORMs. Uh, sourcing queries from the database logs was difficult. Um, Samantha would say, where's this query coming from? And I'd, I'd go, you know, look through the code base. I got no idea, and so I'd have to, you know, kind of just do some splunking until I figured out what code was generating these queries dynamically. And some of that code would be passed, it would pass result sets uh, in between functions and build those up. So you had some, somewhat of a non-deterministic uh, approach to a lot of these queries. Um, you know, the usual amount of technical debt that you see over, you know, decade old application. And that's the thing about, you know, there was a lot of best practices, but they were best practices from 10 years ago. As, you know, as we figure out better ways to do things, those best practices become bit rot and liabilities essentially. I mean, uh, dependency stacks, you know, disappear off, off CPAN. I mentioned this was written in Perl. Um, uh, authors, you know, leave the company. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, when I tried to fit this project into my head, it was kind of like, well, you know, you've got a big old building. How do you change all the electrical sockets? You know, you've got different frequencies, two phase, three phase. You've got DC five volt for USB. Um, so you, you know, you've got a lot of different things to deal with. And how do you deal with that? Empathy. Empathy is a key trait for people in our chosen professions. It's, it's not all technical. You have to, you know, we work with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you're touching someone's code, 
you want to put yourself in the mind of that author. <laughs> what were they thinking? Were they under duress? Did they have a project manager standing behind them saying, is it done? Is it done yet? Did they, you know, add this to a release in the last minute? Um, was it part of a larger refactoring effort that never got finished? There's a whole bunch of things you need to consider. Uh, take for example, a uh, hypothetical person named James who left you know, eight years ago. Uh, he did comment the code and uh, said, okay, yeah, I sit by the elevator, but the elevator is in the old building. Um, you know, there's six Jameses in the company now. Um, they tore down the old building to build a target. And, you know, there's code in there that says, you know, don't touch this, you know, come talk to me first. But uh, then it's commented out and the function just returns. <laughs> so, you know, how, how did I approach something like this? Well, I figured, you know, that code's, you know, the important code's obviously not in use. This is what we have now. Uh, so remove everything else that's commented and keep the existing behavior. Don't try to fix something that may not technically be broken. But then you have other people who are still there. Um, a lot of programmers, I know I am, um, I'm a programmer, but I'm also you know, kind of particular about my code. You know, I, I try not to, but I, I do become emotionally attached to certain pieces of code. And, you know, I'll see someone check in a change to that. And, you know, I think even to a little extent with all of us, you know, it'll create a bit of a visceral reaction. Like, oh, did I, did I create a bug that I missed? Or, um, you know, are, are, are they trying to, you know, rewrite it and breaking it? Or, you know, what's going on there? You know, I, I've got that you know, thought of, you know, I want to make sure that the code's okay. Um, and so when you're, you're doing that at a large scale, you want to make sure to go and, and talk to the authors, um, bring them in, you know, make, help them be part of the effort um, because they are one of your biggest assets in a project like this. Here's an example of how we broke up these queries. Previously, we had this one query. Um, I've highlighted in uh, light red the tables that are now in the main database, and in blue the tables that are in the new marks database. So I had to figure out a way to break these joins and relational integrities. So essentially, this one query turns into two queries. One new query to the main database to grab IDs, and then we take those IDs, which would normally be foreign keys, and we pass those in an in clause to the second query for the marks database. Um, you know, you might think, well, that's, you know, you're gonna lose some performance, and you're right, but we are trading performance for scalability here. And after looking at this after the fact, it turns out that we didn't actually lose that much performance. We gained it in some areas. I mean, we didn't have in clauses generating you know, 10,000 IDs in there, that was a concern. But uh, this approach generally turned out to work fairly well. Transactions. It's easy to do a transaction, single transaction in a single database. You do an insert, uh, select the ID, put that in another table, uh, try to catch an exception. If you get an exception, you do a rollback, else you commit the code. It's pretty simple stuff. But now you have two databases. So you've got to do an insert into the main database, get the ID, take that ID, put it into the second database, and get the new ID for that back. So how do we deal with these dual transactions, dual database transactions? Well, we check for an exception. If it happens, roll back the main database, and roll back the marks database. Or we do a commit on both databases. What if the commit fails? Well, then we've got to eval that statement and check for an exception again. And if that happens, do a rollback twice and do a second eval. But what if the main database rollback fails or the marks database rollback fails? How, how deep do we have to go? Like how high is the stack of turtles here? <laughs> I mean, especially with, you know, if query one takes 
five minutes and your connection to the second database times out, uh, you know, you can, only, you can only do so much to protect your transactions. And then when I started to figure out, well, how do, how do I best handle this, I started to realize something, that I was now building a distributed system. And I'm subject to the CAP theorem, which is Brewer's Law. This is Eric Brewer. He came up with the CAP theorem, consistency, availability, network partitions. In a distributed system, you only get two. Uh, something like this, network partitions were given. So, you know, I was left, well, Am I going to be facing, you know, do I want to give up consistency or do I want to give up availability? And, you know, as someone who's worked with relational databases for a long time, I thought, well, you know, can't give up consistency. Like, you know, I, I even shuddered at, like, breaking these foreign keys. It just, part of it seemed wrong to me. But, uh, I, you know, my views aren't always the ones that contribute to, you know, there's others in the organization who have different views such as users. Users generally uh, like availability. Um, if your data gets a little bit off, they may not notice it, but if your whole site's down, they're going to see that. And customer support will see that too. You know, They'll come over and stand by your desk and wonder what the heck's going on. And the thing about consistency is I can fix that after the fact. We can identify where that's gone wrong, and it's, it does happen, but it's rare, and we can go in and fix that. We can't go back in time and bring that site back up during the service degradation. That's impossible. So the further along I got into this, I, I started to change my views. I thought, you know, availability should really be our prime concern here. And then I had to deal with refactoring ORMs. I love them for writing new code. It saves me a lot of time. But trying to split these models apart was very painful. Um, another issue was ORMs will, you know, they'll generate a giant object when you dump it out to a log. And you've really got to, you've got to pick through there and figure out, okay, which database was I actually talking to? Am I talking to the Marks database or am I talking to the main database? And during development, we had, a copy of each database set up, and we had marked the uh, tables for deletion read-only, which, you know, we did that to um, prevent read access, or to prevent write access to those. But it turns out we would find parts of the code that would, you know, parts of the ORM that would, you know, if, even if you told the ORM in one place, okay, I want these objects to use the marks database, other parts of the ORM would grab a main database handle and you'd be reading from there. So that, that got, you know, that had a lot of uh, uh, debugging work and that was a little bit painful. And, um, you know, it also, it's, it's difficult to break some of those uh, preordained uh, ORM models apart. You know, here's one example of a, of a code generated query. You know, how do you track that down through the logs? Um, you know, what if, what if you've got something like this that in another part of the code base it modifies that query? I mean, that, that's where we got into some of these, you know, dynamically generated SQL non-deterministic queries that were very difficult to track down. And we all know talking to one database is fairly easy. And, it, you know, we thought at the beginning, well, it's, we're just adding another one. That should be, you know, can't, can't be that hard. But uh, we were wrong. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to De Niro from Taxi? Which database is this? Or are you talking to Seinfeld? It's not always obvious. Even when you, you, know, you splunk the logs, you dump objects, you know, there are going to be t uh, edge cases that show up and it's going to hurt. Uh, we had, who's kind of the uh, overall structure. We had one main database or for the main database, we had a master and two slaves. So, you know, we had, we had basically two database handles there. For the Marks database, we had a master and two slaves. And then we had separate users for each application for writing and reading. And this made it really easy to track, it helped out in tracking down queries. You know, we'd have, uh, 
you know, we could look at Zabbix graph and determine how many users were connecting to each database, which was very useful for diagnostics, but it also added entropy to the system because now we've got, you know, multipliers of two all along the way here. And then for each of our environments, uh, we've got six environments. Actually, we had uh, Auto, Test, and Jenkins also, so add a couple more. So getting, getting the configuration correct for all of these was challenging. We didn't have a discovery system in place. We all had this, you know, hand-coded config, and uh, a lot of that used inheritance, and we'd get it wrong. We'd get a connection handle wrong uh, for a certain database, and we figure out that, oh yeah, our, uh, you know, in test, our UK instance is talking to the US slave for um, development. Stuff like that, which is not obvious until you figure it out. And we would we'd bake this configuration into our RPM. So we'd push a build to, you know, to QA, figure out something's wrong, need to do another build. And it was a bit painful. Configuration kind of became a four-letter word. But we're moving to Chef, so it's okay. We're going to get rid of all that. How much tech debt's in your applications? I mean, how do you represent that? Um, I don't know, but there's more of it than you think. There's, you know, tech debt from over the years, code rots, whole applications, you know, whole products will be um, removed. We had one product that was experimental and never got removed from the code base. That turned out to be a sacred cow. And when I came across that in this effort, um, I did not handle it, you know, I didn't have as much empathy as I should have. I went ahead and removed it, um, which caused a little bit of blowback. But I mean, I looked at it, you know, I, I'm trying to scope out this project and I'm halfway through it, and boom, here's a whole other application. Good news is we're not using it. The bad news is, you know, some people are attached to it and I did not, you know, I didn't listen to myself or my future self when I said empathy is a really important factor in something like this. And then how much, you know, when you do a migration like this, how much of that tech, tech debt is capitalized? You know, you're gonna have to pay interest on it. A lot of it. I mean, basically, you, you know, if you do something like this, your database connections are gonna be all over the place and you're going to find code that's broken, and it's been broken for a long time. And people will look at that and they'll say, oh, you know, this change broke this code. And you say, well, no, it's, it's actually been broken for like five years. But, you know, it's also accessible via an API, and a lot of your API customers have just adapted to that. So you can't go back and fix it. Uh, we had a, our longest living app, five ORMs, uh, actually I had no unit tests, but we did have uh, an excellent suite of integration tests, which really saved our bacon. It had two template frameworks built into it. Uh, I think a total of nine different log files, but despite all of that, the code was generally very readable. Yeah. You guys seen this picture before? There was, this was a neighborhood in, in China, and um, there was a set of houses and the Chinese government wanted to pave a freeway through there. This guy refused to sell his house. So they, uh, they built the freeway around it. Uh, some, you know, sometimes that happens in code bases, and, and I came across a few instances of that. I mean, it's, you know, it comes, down, you know, comes back down to empathy. You really have to, you know, with some of the stuff, you have to appeal to people emotionally instead of saying, well, you know, this, you know, we need to do this because of reason X, X, and X. That doesn't always, uh, that doesn't always work. So our release day. We normally use a couple Saturdays a month as possible maintenance windows, and those times are four hours. But this was an eight-hour planned maintenance window, and it had the... Um, the status of being the only maintenance window where we required people to go into the office on a Saturday because we love doing that. So we planned for a 9 a.m. Saturday release window. 
required 15 people plus product support. They work Saturdays anyway, so. Um, two and a half hours for our main service. We started that first because it was the most critical. We were finished right around lunchtime. Um, two, hour, two and a half hours of total downtime to roll out the two new databases, the code, the testing, which usually takes a bulk of time. At that point, we took a nice breather, moved on to our second geographical shard, the UK, finished it in much less time. Part of that was because we were able to do some of the things during the first step and multitask. Some of it was because we just got better at it. The first time we tried this process and testing, it took us two days. So from two days to two and a half hours for a single service, we were pretty happy with that. Um, and then we got to our sandbox, which is our customer development sandbox. So it's not an internal sandbox, and it's, it's an external sandbox. And that took two hours and a lot of cat videos. Um, there were things in that service that have never worked, but because this was critical and it was a focused release for us, we wanted everything to work. So things that we've never had functionality, they better damn well work now. Brace yourselves. That was exactly what happened. Um, even during release, we identified issues that we were on Monday patching. We had five patches to date. And what are the patch flavors? What types of things happen when you do this? Because these are the things you didn't see coming. And we found that the flavors are, how did that get there? Well, because that one developer decided that his code needed to go in this release, even though we said, no, don't do that. So that was feature creep. Then there's the, the no, that's really a bug. Oops, yeah, that's, that's a bug. No denying it, I'll own it, that's a bug. It worked fine in dev, I don't care that the house is on fire now, but these are the things that when we rolled out during the middle of summer, it was fine. We chose a low point because that's what you do. Intelligent people pick a low point and then you build up your load. So now we're hitting the semester. We're finding that with the students coming in, we're hitting more load than we've ever had and we're finding these bugs. These are things that we could have never found in testing because they require realistic load, which no one has 100% realistic load. But now we're seeing them. So this is the most recent one that we found. We had uh, one query for a real-time report that um, behaved fine in development and testing, but uh, when fed certain parameters, uh, it caused the query planner to, quote, do dumb things and um, caused the service degradation. And one, one thing we've learned in this effort is, you know, at the beginning, everyone will, will say, you know, we're doing it for this reason, but um, over time, they'll, they'll forget that. And they'll forget that, you know, you've had successes, but when you have a service degradation, that affects people very viscerally. You know, they, you, you know, you feel it in your gut. You know, someone says, hey, you know, there's a degradation going on, and you're just like, shit. You know. How do you bring your entire site to a halt with a setup like this? You can start a transaction in database one, start a second one, and you wait for transaction one to finish. And here's what happens. Panic. This is Zabbix graph of uh, Apache web prox. You can see pretty clearly that we hit max prox. And how fast did it happen? 60 seconds. <laughs> what can you do? I mean, this is a, this is a fairly common failure mode for uh, process-based web servers. You know, if you've got a system that can block and that blocking results in other web processes blocking, you see something like this. This one, um, it's kind of subtle, but incredibly important. That red line on the bottom is IO wait. So what we found was that one slave, because of our intertwined system, where the application, where in best practices 15 years ago, is fully competent to look through the whole thing and determine if hardware is available, says that one slave is having an issue, and it will continue to use that slave. So this one slave had a query that caused very high I.O. That cascaded up the stack and caused the web procs as you saw before. 
So where do we go? We originally wanted a DAL. We wanted DAL for all the reasons that we stated above, because we knew that there was tech debt, we knew that there was legacy code that was gonna be incredibly difficult to pull out, and we wanted abstraction, we wanted security and bulkheads. There were a lot of reasons that we really wanted to do this, but it turns out we now know way more than we did before. That archeology span paid off. It paid off in spades, because we wouldn't have found this stuff, we wouldn't have known what we were going up against at that point. And uh, heard a great quote the other day. The first split is the hardest. And I thought, you've done more than one of these? Uh, that was said by some guy here. I think he's giving the closing remarks. And that's it. Questions? The question is, what kind of sizing our new servers were? Uh, the new servers have uh, a 1.2 tera um, SSD RAID for its main PG data partition. They have 96 gigs RAM, and they were uh, eight cores. The ones they were coming from were 16 cores with 148 gigs RAM, and the same 600 gig per um, drive SSD partitions. Yes. Any type of what tools? Coverage tools. Um, I looked at the logs a lot. <laughs> um, that's primarily what we went to. And are you talking about when we, we saw the, the SQL come to the server or walking it back? Um, we, we used PG for Wing to do some of that analysis. Um, <laughs> You know, there were, uh, there were parts of the app even after the refactor that, um, you know, we saw old queries that we couldn't catch. Um, so we, we relied heavily on, you know, QA to, to look for those. I mean, we, we had a great QA team. They would get in there onto the boxes, tail the logs, post queries up into Jira. And so we did use a, we used a lot of brute force there. Um, Doing an automated coverage was difficult because we had, you know, probably about four or five different heterogeneous code bases. So, so tooling up something to to look into each of those individually was tough. I mean, we did have uh, one uh, uh, database uh, base class ORM, which we were able to do some instrumentation in and catch a lot of that stuff. Does that answer your question? Kind of both. Um, we, were, we were at a point where we were buying um, next-gen hardware pretty much cutting edge, and it was so prohibitively expensive to continue down that path. Um, and because of the intertwined nature of our services, we really thought that the most stable thing to do for the service as a whole was to start breaking pieces apart. Because when you get one thing that depends on another thing that are kind of unrelated, you are adding risk. So it was... Yes, this hardware is expensive, and it's it's possible we can keep buying hardware as soon as it gets released. But we saw issues with that. Like we just did that one final time, and we had kernel issues. Um, we were seeing all kinds of this this configuration of hardware hasn't been tested out yet by pretty much any other large company. So um, we had issues with the RAID controller and whatnot. So there were there were things we wanted to get back to a standardized SKU um, and basically have a standard piece of hardware for all databases across the company. And that meant that our smaller databases had to be the same um, size and the same use scenarios as our main database. Yes? Um, did you have any releases while you were doing the refactoring? And if you did, how did you keep track of changes made for new functionality versus stuff you were doing so the question was, did we have new releases and how did we keep track of those changes versus what we were doing? Uh, we did the development on a subversion branch 
and about midway through the development effort for this, we had to do a patch release, which introduced, uh, a new, I think it was a major new feature for our iPad. How many, actually, we actually had two patch releases for the previous large release in the middle of this. So we basically assigned a developer, said, okay, that new feature, port it over to this branch. Um, we didn't do a major code merge between the two branches. Uh, all of this development was done in isolation on a branch, and um, everything else was pretty much put on hold for this effort. I mean, we, we did have the release after this one on an entirely separate branch also. And so at the end of this release, uh, we did a week-long merge effort to merge this release into that next release that was coming out a month later. So there was a there was a lot of subversion merges, um, a lot of sitting down with programmers saying like, okay, you know, here's the new way to access this database. Here's the example code. Go ahead and merge that into, you know, the next release after this one. Why were we embarrassed to run Sloney? We're not embarrassed by it. It's just that we had been wanting to move to streaming because of performance um, issues. It is when we moved over some of our services, we got a quarter of our CPU back. Um, it's we have designs for the future that don't really allow us to to f streaming would be a much more stable thing for us at this point. Um, and Sony has been the cause of a lot of of pain, especially like we use Sony log shipping. I think we're one of like two people that. There are two companies that use Sony log shipping, and we use that for DR between um, data centers. Um, and it's extremely problematic. We have queries, uh, say array syntax with uh, Sony log shipping causes errors and will cause replication to go down. And then we found that the slave is lagging by three days because it was over the weekend, and we didn't want to look at it because it's DR. So streaming replication is really something that we want to push forward with, and we'll, we're on that path. Is that it? All right, thanks guys.